So hello all and welcome to this session of the 2021 Biocommons Showcase, which it's entitled Community Engagement Outputs. I'm Jeff Christensen and I'm the Associate Director of uh, Research Engagement and Operations at the Australian Biocommons. Um, before we start, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianships of the lands on which we meet today. For me, I'm based in Brisbane and that's the Yagara and Turrbal people. Uh, we pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country and recognise their valuable con contributions to Australian and global society. Um, there's several, I guess, purposes for this session today, um, and that is uh, to introduce the Biocommons community engagement team, um, and they're going to describe the strategies and methods we've developed to engage various communities of life science researchers across Australia. Um, and also importantly, we are going to hear from three researchers who have been actively involved in these community engagements. Um, and they've had the opportunity to both influence the development of shared infrastructure that um, you know, was envisaged to be able to help address some bottlenecks and challenges that they've faced in their research. And also to now hear how, how these researchers are actually using these services that have been deployed by the Biocommons and our many um, partners and how they're supporting their research. So during this session, I'll introduce each speaker. Um, if anyone in the audience has any questions during the talks, please enter these into the Q&A or the chat box. We'll have hopefully five minutes at the end to answer questions. Um, and also during the uh, webinar, during the hour, the speakers will be able to respond to any questions that you've entered in the chat box directly. Okay, so first up, we're gonna hear from uh, the Biocommons community engagement team. So that's Tiff Nelson and Johan Gustafsson. And they're gonna introduce the strategies and methods that we've um, developed and used to engage communities of life science researchers. So over to you, Tiff. Thanks, Jeff. Hi, everyone. Uh, I would like to introduce you to our engagement team and the Australian bioinformatics landscape that we are working in. The Australian Biocommons engagement team is made up of myself, Johan and Jeff, and we are tasked with identifying the needs of life science researchers to identify what digital bioinformatics infrastructure will support their research. Johan and I work together on engaging national communities of practice from all universities and institutes, and Johan ensures that these communities extend to established research collaborations, including the BioPlatforms Australia Framework initiatives. The Australian Biocommons was established with a mission to develop digital capacity, training and bioinformatics infrastructure to support Australia's life science researchers. Indicated in the Biocommons principles, we have a national focus around communities and capabilities to provide access to sophisticated analysis, including software and hardware platforms, and the support of digital asset stewardship and management. When we take a look at the landscape of life science researchers in Australia, there are about 100,000 publicly funded, and of those, 30% are in the biosciences related fields. Next slide, please, Jeff. Of those bioscience researchers, there are four main expertise types. The wet lab scientists who use uh, computer-based tools infrequently, but can navigate web platforms such as NCBI or BLAST. The data intensive scientist who uses omics analysis as a critical part of their research outcomes. Then there are the bioinformatics intensive scientists whose research is dependent on their advanced use of bioinformatics. And lastly, there are the bioinformaticians whose research is exclusively um, dependent on the technique, tool development and algorithm writing. Next slide, please. Our goal in community engagement is to understand the researchers' challenges when it comes to digital infrastructure and to empower life scientists to spend more time performing research and less time on computational infrastructure management. To effectively understand researcher challenges and possible solutions, we have developed a five-step engagement process. In the, first in the first step, we identify uh, the communities of researchers that have known infrastructure challenges these are largely defined by a biological method or technique in the life sciences fields, such as de novo genome assembly or annotation, microbiome analysis, proteomics, and others. 
The second step in the process is to research and review what defines each community's challenges and identify the common tools and methods used to undertake the technique. The third, third step is to survey and discuss with the community their roadblocks and challenges and also suggestions for solutions. In the fourth step, we document the issues and challenges and formalize these ideas into an infrastructure roadmap that detail the community problems while also defining the potential solutions and deployments to, to um, resolve those challenges. This draft document is then shared with infrastructure providers, international and national experts, along with the community of practitioners for review before we finalize that document and get an endorsement by that broader community. In the final step of this process, we identify solutions described in the roadmap that can be deployed for each community. These are established and deployed in an iterative process with hosting partner organizations first identified, then deployment and with collaborative testing and feedback from members of each community. Next slide, please, Jeff. So here is a snapshot view of our current domain specific communities and their stages of engagement. You will see we have seven communities so far and most of them have a draft or finalized version of an infrastructure roadmap. And some of the most mature engagements have deployments identified through the engagement process to support their research. I will now hand over to Johan and he's going to give us a bit more detail on our communities. Thanks, Tiff. Uh, the researcher communities of practice that Tiff mentioned uh, are highlighted on this slide and they represent either specific analytical aims like genome assembly or annotation or entire domains like metabolomics and proteomics. The engagements we undertake are actually more diverse and collaborative than these communities might suggest. Next slide, please. As Tiff pointed out, the engagements with these communities identify and collaboratively define fit for purpose solutions to community challenges in bioinformatics. And this naturally entails working collaboratively with our partner computational infrastructures. And you can see um, them provide logos for these uh, partners provided on this slide. Next slide, please. But there are two distinct groups that we also engage with and which also overlap heavily with the research and infrastructure communities. The first group is the data production or core facilities and the second is a group of national consortia. The core facilities concentrate expertise in end-to-end -end sample processing, measurement and bioinformatics analysis and are indispensable elements of the Australian research community. Some examples of these include the Ramachotti Centre for Genomics, the Australian Proteome Analysis Facility, Metabolomics Australia, and the Australian Genome Research Facility. The consortia are national scale research efforts. They span multiple research institutions and organizations. And importantly, they, support, they are supported by key science drivers like conservation genomics. The ones that we engage are primarily BioPlatforms Australia framework initiatives and include examples like the Threatened Species Initiative, um, and the Australian Amphibian and Reptile Genomics Initiative, but this also extends to groups like the Australian Pest Genome Partnership. There are pre-existing and fundamental connections between the communities of practice, National Life Sciences Consortia and data production facilities, and the Biocommerce has been working to extend this connection through to fit for purpose compute. Next slide, please. So we have three overlapping communities engaged with a consistent need to find access and reuse fit for purpose computational infrastructure. Key to this is the usage of infrastructure in a more coordinated manner and the Biocommons is playing this integrative and coordinating role. Next slide, please. Today we'll hear from three members of these communities. So we're gonna hear from Julia Volker from Southern Cross Uni, Matt Padula from the University of Technology Sydney Proteomics Corps and Harder Patel from the Australian Amphibian and Reptile Genomics Framework Initiative. And they're gonna give us a bit more insight into the work that they've been doing. Thank you. Thanks, Johan, and thanks, Tiff. Okay, so a reminder to our attendees, if you do have any questions, please just pop them into the uh, Q&A or the chat box, and we'll, we'll uh, go through those at the end. And, and Tiff and Johan will be able to respond in that chat box um, as well. So now we will hear from Julia Volker, 
Uh, Julia is based at Southern Cross Plant Science in Lismore um, and has been involved in the Biocommons Genome Assembly and Annotation Community Groups that Tip talked about and is going to talk to us today around, uh, around the topic of constructing the genome of the Australian tea tree Melaleuca alternifolia. Welcome, Julia. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so hello, everybody. Um, so as Jeff already mentioned, I'm a PhD candidate at Southern Cross Plant Science, which is part of the Faculty of Science and Engineering at SCU. Um, next slide, please. Um, at Southern Cross Plant Science, a part of our research focuses on accelerating breeding efforts for certain crops, and therefore it's important to have correct information from high quality genome assemblies and annotations. And these allow us, for example, to identify molecular markers that are associated with certain traits of interest, and these markers can then be used for um, crop improvements by molecular breeding. To date, um, Southern Cross Plant Science, together with academic and industry partners, have published three genome assemblies and annotations. And these are the macadamia chromosome scale assembly, the melaleuca or tea tree scaffold scale assembly, and the brassica rapa yellow sarsen chromosome scale assembly. And these assemblies can all be used as a foundation um, for molecular breeding. And all three projects are using resources provided by the Australian Biocommons, but I'm only gonna talk about the tea tree project a bit further today. Um, next slide, please. So we recently published a high quality draft genome assembly for Melaleuca alternifolia together with the gene prediction as well. And in order to create the data for this project, um, we used um, Galaxy Australia and um, FGenes Age and Apollo, which are all resources provided by the Australian Biocommons. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I think it was, yep. So just to give you a general idea of the plant that I'm working with, um, Melaleuca alternifolia is related to eucalyptus brandners. They're both native Australian trees and belong to the Mutaceae. And this family is known for its species richness in Australia and for the diversity of essential oils produced by these trees. And these essential oils, such as tea tree, eucalypt, or lemon myrtle oil, are all composed of a wide array of terpenoids, which can have different antimicrobial properties. And that's what makes them so valuable for medicinal and cosmetic products. Um, next slide. So um, the three molecules you can see here are some of the volatile components of tea tree oil. And the plant produces them in response to biotic and abiotic stresses, such as heat stress, herbivore damage, or pathogens. The last step of the terpenoid synthesis is catalyzed by a family known as terpene synthases, or TPS. And the production of these compounds is part of the defense response by the plant. And since some of these terpenoids are produced to fend off bacterial and fungal infections, they have these antimicrobial properties. And that's why tea tree and also other mutaceae are economically important species for Australia, and they're grown in industrial scales for the extraction of their essential oils. So as part of my project, we are interested in this protein family of terpene synthases and in the genes that encode these proteins. But in order to learn more about them, we first needed a high quality genome assembly for tea tree. Next slide. So um, here's a general um, overview of the workflow that I used. I started with DNA extraction and DNA sequencing. Those sequences were then used for um, a new genome assembly, whereby I compared three different assembly tools for their performance. And the best assembly was then used for automatic gene prediction before I finally refined the um, predictions of some gene families, or in my case, the terpene synthases, further um, in manual gene annotations. Um, next. So when I started my PhD, I was really new to bioinformatics. Most of my previous experience um, was based in the wet lab. So I spent a lot of time researching the different tools that I could use and um, 
how to install them on our server at SEU. So unfortunately, at the beginning, I wasn't aware of the um, BioCommons resources. It could have saved me a lot of time had I known about them right from the beginning. So the tools that I'm listing here are just some of the examples that I could have used right at the beginning. For example, task 2 c is for quality control of raw sequencing reads. And also two of the assemblers that are used, which are Canoe and Fly, are also available on Galaxy Australia. So there's this um, huge array of different software available on Galaxy Australia, and I definitely could have saved time by using them straight from the beginning. Um, so I was um, getting aware of that platform after we finished with my um, genome assembly and then started to use those resources more. Um, next slide, please. So um, on this slide, I wanna show you the resources that I actually um, use. Oh, I think one more click, please, Jeff. Um, so after I was finished with my genome assembly, I had to assess the assembly completeness. And therefore, I used BASCO, which is available on Galaxy Australia. And in BASCO, you compare your genome sequences to a certain, ref, um, certain set of reference sequences. And the reference databases are being updated quite regularly. So by going to Galaxy Australia, um, this saved me a lot of time because I didn't have to research whether any databases were available. I didn't have to install anything. I basically only had to update my genome assembly, um, upload it to Galaxy, and then um, select which database I want to compare my sequences to. Um, next, please. Um, the next step, once I had my high quality assembly was the automatic gene prediction, and therefore I used FGenes Edge. And here, um, BioCommons provided me with all the resources that I needed. So they gave me the license to use FGenes Edge and the server, as well as instructions on how to use it, and also um, the reference gene matrix, which in my case was from eucalyptus genes. Um, so this saved me a lot of time and money as well, because it can be quite expensive to get um, a user license for FGNSH. Next step. Um, and after my automatic gene prediction, I then had to assess the completeness of these predictions. Therefore, I went back to Galaxy Australia again, um, used BASCO with my protein sequences, and also another tool that's available on Galaxy, which is PetMatDB which allows me to screen my protein sequences for um, conserved amino acid motives. Uh, next step, please, Jeff. And finally, I then did um, the manual gene annotation of the terpene synthase gene family, and therefore I used the Apollo platform. And Apollo is really great for collaboration as well. So it allowed me to update um, to upload all my sequences, so the genome assembly, different gene predictions, as well as all kinds of evidence tracks. But also while I'm doing these annotations, my supervisors have access to the same data basically in real time, so they could add their input as well. And even so, the terpene synthase annotation is still private at the moment. I know that the other annotations from SEU, so the macadamia and the brassica annotations, they are being made available to the research. Yeah, so we just hope that the research community can help to improve um, already published gene models um, through um, addition of further evidence data. Uh, basically, that's all I wanted to show you um, today. I think that's enough. Um, yeah, you can jump to the final slide if you want. To. And thanks a lot for your attention and thanks for the Australian BioCommons and the Policy Supercomputing Centre for their support. Thanks very much, Julia. So next we will be hearing from Hardit Patel. Um, he is based at ANU um, in Canberra. Um, and uh, Hardip is the bioinformatics coordinator or one of the bioinformatics coordinators along with Terry Vitozzi of the Australian Reptile and Amphibian Genome Initiative. Um, and that, that is a, a, a national collaboration across 50 or so research organ organizations that are producing genomic reference data sets for Australian native reptiles and amphibians. So um, over to you, Hardip. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, 
I would also like to begin by acknowledging traditional custodians on whose lands we uh, live and work uh, today and pay my respects to the leaders past, present and emerging. I'm from the Australian National University and I'll sh share some details about the consortium, uh, Reptile uh, and Amphibian Genomics, uh, or in short, we call it OZARG. And I'm speaking on behalf of the consortium and Terry and I've been assigned, uh, Terry and I have been assigned as bioinformatics and computational biology leads within the consortium to coordinate compute and data related activities for OZAR and to ensure the capacity is built for long, uh, long term use of these resources. Next slide, please. So, OZARG is one of many bioplatforms framework initiatives started a couple of years ago. Its main aim is to deliver platinum quality genomic resources using cutting edge sequencing technologies and analytical platforms. Projects within OZARG initiatives are driven by relevant questions of substance in species conservation and management or discovery using Australian amphibian and reptile species. OZARG has over the past two years assembled a team of project leads that can drive these research priorities and collectively build capacity to assemble, annotate, and curate genomic resources at scale. As a whole, the OZAR collaborative network builds capacity to attract funding as well to contribute to put Australian genomic science at the forefront of innovations in this space. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So it is a national initiative as Jeff mentioned, and there are multiple teams across Australia driving individual research projects within the OZAR umbrella. And here I show some of the examples of the types of projects that are underway. For example, Camila and Oliver's team are looking at evolution of viviparity and placentation. Arthur Georges uh, leads a team of researchers for the identification of sex determining genes in bearded dragons and other rept reptilian species. Craig Moritz and Janine Deakin are leading the work on chromosome evolution in geckos. And similarly, Terry Bertozzi and Mike Gardner are looking into host parasite interactions in blue tongue lizard. Ren Renee and her group are working on genome size variability and evolution in frogs. And Rich Edwards and uh, the company are looking at the transition to marine life and venom genetics in lapid snakes. So at the last count, there were 24 genomes being sequenced under the OZARG umbrella and associated collaborative projects. There are many other related projects uh, to OZARG as well. So uh, there will be many genomes generated through this whole initiative. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the uh, ways that OZARG has organized to support all of these individual research projects at uh, different locations is to form, uh, uh, I mean, to support in terms of bioinformatics, computational and data storage requirements is to form this uh, team of bioinformatics expert advisory group. So this group has uh, expertise in genome assembly, annotation, evaluation, and comparative genomics required for the OZARG. And uh, this advisory group meets once every six months or so to provide advice and to discuss progress of individual projects and provide their input. And individual members of this group also collaborate with individual projects as the need emerges and the interests of collaborative nature are identified. Uh, next slide, please, Jeff. So another critical component in the whole framework is definitely compute and data storage requirements. So BioPlatforms Australia has a data, port data archival portal that all bioplatform projects use. And uh, that's a great initiative because the data is at least archived at the source. And there is substantial compute and data storage requirements though beyond the archival storage. As an approximate indication for each genome, we need about one terabyte of storage for whole genome and transcriptome sequence data. Analysis and comparative genomics can take up to two terabytes of additional storage per genome. And when it comes to computing, genome assembly can take up to 50,000 CPU hours. Transcriptome assembly and alignments can take nearly 25,000 CPU hours. And genome annotation and comparative analysis can each take up to 100,000 CPU hours. Now, these are approximate numbers, of course. And depending on the genome, the complexity of the genome, the sequencing platform used, 
types of intended analysis, these requirements can be way larger than uh, what are written here. Uh, next slide, please, Jeff. So to ensure success uh, for all projects, what we did was uh, form critical partnership with ABLES, uh, which is a biocommons initiative. And through these initiatives, uh, we have been allocated 100, 100 terabytes of storage and 4 million, <clears throat> 4 million service units at the NCI for using Gardi platform. Further details can be found at the GitHub link and other biocommons websites. Uh, there are two key advantages we have noticed that benefit not only OZAR community, but other initiatives too in this space. First is the centralized software repository that is maintained by researchers for use by researchers. So ABLES has uh, facilitated these activities and allows for principled approach to software management. Other benefits of NC using NCI are the availability of Jupyter Lab and virtual desktop environments to run interactive analysis without having to transfer data between computers and institutes. And NCI being the national facility that naturally allows for collaborations because, uh, and avoiding the institutional <clears throat> IT security policies. So there are many other R, Python, and Perl libraries already available and installed at NCI, and a lot of them are being installed by the OSARC members. And second benefit is about the scalability. So NCI Guardi has about 50 nodes with 1.5 terabytes of RAM. So we can launch 50 assemblies in one go if we uh, had enough data. And there are 150 GPU nodes for all the base calling and machine learning requirements that will emerge. And there are 3000 nodes with 48 cores and 190 GB RAM, uh, which can be used for some serious computing. So thanks to ABLES and BioCommons that we have access to these resources, and in the last slide, uh, next slide, Jeff, I will just uh, highlight a couple of things uh, that we are doing. So, so far we have installed about 20 software packages and the list is growing as the needs uh, emerge. Uh, and anyone is welcome to contribute to this and anyone is welcome to use these software packages. It is a community resource. Uh, Using this uh, and using the scalability afforded by the NCI, we can now run transcriptome assembly of around 250 samples in less than six hours and repeat mask a genome in less than four hours. So this can be improved further if the data size grows, but for now this is sufficient for our requirements. And Terry uh, Bertozzi has implemented Salsa as an explore workflow for use in scaffolding of the genomes. There are other phylogenomics workflows that are being developed as well at the NCI. All in all, the availability, availability of the NCI resources through ABLES is improving efficiency and output for the OSARG initiative and the goal of uh, the sort of contributing at a larger scale to the Earth Biogenome and Vertebrate Genome projects once we have enough funds to sequence all of life in Australia. So these facilities are crucial and uh, we need to keep maintaining this uh, support uh, for this activity so that we can perform this analysis at a larger scale. With that, I end my presentation. Thank you. Thanks very much, Hardev. So we'll move now on to hear from Matt Padula. Uh, Matt is um, based at UTS, the University of Technology, Sydney, and runs the proteomics core there, the proteomics facility. Um, and he's been involved in the Biocommons proteomics community group that, um, uh, with Johan, and is going to talk to us today about how he is leveraging Galaxy Australia to help teach proteomics. Over to you, Matt. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, afternoon, all. Um, you could move on to the next slide, please. Um, so I'm here to talk about something quite different. Uh, with, there's been a lot of talk about genomics and I know that Galaxy gets used most often for genomics work at the moment, but uh, there has been an increasing move towards doing proteomics and metabolomics and lipidomics analysis using Galaxy. So uh, I'm just going to introduce, because the audience may not know, um, a little bit about proteomics. I don't want to go into this too deeply, but Essentially what we wanna do is we want to measure how the abundance and the number of proteins within an organism or a cell change through different conditions or over time. There's loads and loads of different experiments that you can do 
um, under that umbrella. And um, I'm not going to go into them because that's a whole hour long presentation in itself. Suffice to say that proteomics is heavily reliant on mass spectrometry and the, the two mass spectrometers that we use are uh, depicted over there on the side of the slide. But what mass spectrometry does is it gives you this enormous long list of numbers with regard to peptide mass, fragmentation masses and abundance numbers for those things. And because you've got a whole long list of numbers, you can do some quite powerful statistics on these things to work out um, what your fold change of abundance of things are, how reliable identifications are, and so on. Uh, Proteomics-based mass spectrometry has been going on probably for about 25 years now. And historically, it is reliant on proprietary software. Um, and so within our laboratory up until recently, um, we would use things like Peak Studio, Progenesis, um, things that you have to pay licenses for. So um, we do a lot of teaching of people who don't know anything about proteomics. It's not one of these intuitive things that gets taught at an undergraduate level. So one of the things that we end up with is we teach our high degree research students, our honours students, and also we teach master students uh, coursework master students how to use proteomics and apply it. Now the problem is that most people see this as a tool rather than a vocation and so all they want to do is have a really nice simple way of putting their data in and getting information back out and proprietary software is the easiest way to do that. The problem is that proprietary software and teaching large numbers of students don't necessarily work together and so what we need to teach these students is how do you search this data and how do you interpret the data that comes out? Um, next slide, please. So here we go. Um, what happens is no matter what pipeline you use or what um, search engine you use, the process is pretty much the same where you're extracting the biomolecules, you're doing some kind of separation, um, you're turning them into peptides, you're putting them through the mass spectrometer. So the pipeline doesn't change. So you can teach that quite easily. What does change is the specific software that people use, but they all end up providing the same answer. So within this regard, we teach them some of the proprietary software but one of the things that we would like to be able to teach them is some of the more common um, uh, open source software that's out there, such as MaxQuant. So one of the problems that we run into is how do we actually create the resources to be able to teach people? Um, next slide, please. So delivering content online was a thing before COVID. Um, so um, what we do in our postgraduate teaching, and this is probably common across a number of universities, is that we do a whole lot of stuff through online learning systems. And then we come in and we do workshops to reinforce the content. So when it came to actually training kids on how to teach them how to do proteomics, we would have to develop a whole lot of materials that were specific for certain pipelines. And then along comes Galaxy. Um, and so Galaxy has changed, has made life a little bit simpler because the first thing that we can do is we can go onto the training website. They've got a number of wonderful tutorials that have been created by people like Melanie Foll and Matthias and a number of other people, especially in Europe, to teach people how to use these analyses pipelines. So what I can do is rather than spending a lot of time updating lectures and things like that, I can send the kids over to here and go, right, I want you to, to log in, I create an account, go into the tutorial, work your way through this on the data that's there and screw it up, fix it. The other side of this is that I don't now have to install any software anywhere. I don't have to go to my local IT people and say, oh, I need you to install Peak Studio as a viewer on 50 computers. No, all I have to do is direct them to a website. And the website actually really does proper processing because this is open source available software. You can put real data into it. 
Whereas the proprietary stuff, we would have to prepare the, we would have to do all of the searching ourselves, give them the data, which then that they could view and do some limited manipulation on. They couldn't really screw it up. This way, they can screw it up and they can learn something by making uh, those mistakes. Um, next slide, please. So one of the things that we really wanna do, and this got hamstrung um, by COVID again, is uh, because students weren't allowed into the laboratory to do things, is that um, we have about 50 students. They work in pairs, so now we've got 25 groups of students. They all do a control and a treatment sample to work through doing a proteomics experiment. So we end up with about 50 files in total. Um, each student has their, their two one gigabyte data files of mass spectrometry data. So what do we do with this? And as I said, if we were going to do this with proprietary software, we would have to pay for a license for each one of those things, or the students would have to go and organize a 30 day trial license with someone. The company's probably gonna ring me up and go, why are you taking up all these trial licenses? But also university computers are not really that powerful. Um, and so getting them to run their searches on a desktop uh, can take days of computational time because there's a lot, a lot of data in these files that needs to be searched. And so you can't leave a university computer in a computing lab running the same search for days. Someone's going to stop it. Something's going to screw up. Um, and then on top of that, MaxQuant's actually quite hard to get your head around on the desktop version. I haven't included a picture of how that works. Um, but I've included a snapshot of what it looks like on Galaxy. And it really does take the complexity out of setting the searches up. Um, if anything, I much prefer setting my searches up normally using the Galaxy interface because um, there is so much complexity behind the desktop version of Galaxy. And whoever has created the, the shell for this version on Galaxy um, has really thought about it and gone, no, we don't need that option. We don't need that option and streamline things down. Um, so there's massive numbers, amounts of advantages of using this to, to teach proteomics. We don't have any installation or licensing. We can run it from anywhere. They can do it from home and do their remote learning. We get faster searching and it won't get stopped by someone. And it's just easier to set stuff up. Um, next one, please. So... Did it work? Yep. Um, we had almost no problems. And the problems that did occur were mainly students not listening to what they were supposed to be doing. The main one was not really realizing that they should go through the particular link to go into the dedicated area that was set up for us. We had our own dedicated part of Galaxy to run stuff in. Um, and the other one was people leaving their analysis till the last moment. They reported that things were easy to follow. They didn't have any problems setting up searches. The only thing that they were surprised at that it did take a long time to, for those searches to complete, but they had no reference point. They didn't know how long these things would normally take to, com to complete. In my experience, it works about the same as a really high performance desktop, like dedicated graphics cards and things like that to speed things up. So it is pretty reasonable. Uh, next slide. So the last thing that I just want to close on is we do actually use this for training our HDRs as well. Same idea. We tell the HDRs here, here's a whole lot of resources that you can go in and familiarize yourself with software, learn how to do stuff, and then come back to us for further in-depth discussion. Um, and uh, they can do this without having to get um, the ITD to organize things for themselves. And with that, I'm done. Um, there was only the acknowledgements, but that's okay. We don't need to worry about that. Um, and I hope I've managed to convince you that uh, Galaxy is a useful tool for teaching people any kind of these bioinformatic pipelines. Thanks. Thanks very much, Matt. If I could get all the speakers to turn their video on and, um, and we'll just have a general discussion. Um, and I, I guess I'm interested in, so 
we hear that, you know, obviously in order to conduct a bioinformatics analysis, you know, you need to access appropriate infrastructure. So that, that's a bit of a no brainer. Um, I guess I'm interested in, you know, we heard today that some of the challenges can be technical. So for instance, getting access to a system with enough compute power or an appropriate architecture, but often those challenges are actually social and it's, you know, rules around access and, you know, how can I collaboratively work on some, on, on infrastructure. So I guess I was just hoping that each of the speakers might be able to, you know, take a minute or so to reflect on your experiences to date and just around that, you know, the, the, the challenges around the social versus the technical and what are the, you know, what are your opinions on, I guess, the most important aspects that, you know, the, you know, Australia as a nation should really think about when we're developing, um, you know, a more fit for purpose ecosystem. So it's quite broad um, and I'll, I won't put anyone on the spot. So I don't know if, if anyone has a specific, who wants to go first. I can have a stab at it, uh, but technical challenges uh, are around this uh, availability of shared resources because each institute has their own firewall protections and also limitations on data storage and requirements. So collaboration generally becomes very limited if uh, there is no shared infrastructure. And we heard from uh, Matt as well that, that, that these are the issues, right? Like so. Uh, that is definitely like if there is a shared infrastructure such as NCI and POSI, but many more probably in different contexts available, then that can resolve that issue of extended collaborations. Uh, now, social aspects of it, like uh, as Tiff mentioned around, like, you know, there are four different kinds of researchers in this space. And, you know, we, it's just basically the shared infrastructure that caters to four different kinds of researchers, but also seeing uh, progressive path of researchers through that journey if they want to become more data savvy or not uh, towards the end. I'll stop there. Yeah, I guess from, from my point of view, thinking about it, um, when you are working with external collaborators, um, I mean, we, we have our own HPC system and things like that. Um, I, I don't tend to use it because, you know, not really being a computational person, it, I have to learn and figure out how to log into it and be able to share it with people who are not on campus or are not within the university trying to figure that out. I mean, in this way, um, you know, I can create a, a workspace in Galaxy. Um, I can upload all of the raw data into that. I can then share it to various people who are not within the institution. And as long as they know what they're doing, they can go and grab that data and then look at all of the pipelines that they've got available to them. So they don't have to search it with MaxQuant. They can search it with OpenMS or the other things that are there, or they can do things with their own settings that I may not have done with, rather than ringing me up and say, oh, can you spend five minutes, go back and search this in a different way and then send me the 20 gigabyte data file they can go in and actually set it up themselves and just run that. And then I can look at it and go, oh, okay, this happened and this happened, download the data files. So it, it does make that kind of collaboration a lot more straightforward because you don't have to go through the rigmarole of trying to give people access to systems that are locked down. Um, yep, I guess it's my turn. Um, so yeah, when it comes to the um, technical issues, I mean, we have a good server here at Southern Cross University. Um, I had a good infrastructure available, but for me, um, as someone who basically had only wet lab experience before, the issues I faced at the beginning were more the technical ones and um, how to install different software, um, what kind of environment I needed to run um, the tools. And um, I mean, it wasn't an, um, an interesting experience for me, but I guess I could have um, definitely had an easier life by simply using the software that's available on Galaxy. Um, when it comes to the, the social aspect, um, I haven't tried sharing anything on Galaxy, but I mean, from the Apollo annotation platform, 
um, I can say it's really helpful that you don't have to send around any files. You can just share all your annotations and everyone has access to them online via the Apollo platform. That way you don't end up having all kinds of different files and losing um, an overview of what is the actual um, annotation that you're using at the moment. And um, I know that with the other um, research communities that are annotating the macadamia and the brassica um, genomes, I think it's really helpful. You can share your annotations with worldwide research communities um, using one platform and everyone can basically add their evidence. So that's really helpful. Thanks, Julia. Um, we have a question in the chat. Um, I'll just go to that now. Um, Conrad is asking, um, it's great to see resources such as um, Hardit was uh, highlighting there at NCI for the OzArg initiative, but that example wouldn't work in the health space because there's regulatory requirements that make transfer of the data to the compute very difficult, if not impossible. Um, he's interested in what does the Viacom and see its role in relation to the medical and health informatics community? So I can answer that. And um, so, yes, we do. We, we have a, our human genomics informatics initiative. Um, we're gonna discuss that on Friday afternoon at the showcase. So please come along to that. Um, I guess our, one of our philosophies is always to uh, adopt and adapt technologies that are proven elsewhere. We're, we're rarely you know, the, the first people wanting to develop these types of collaborative infrastructures. Um, in the human space, we take a lead uh, from the US where the National Institutes of Health have had a, a genomic data commons, a data commons um, program, multi, multi million dollars invested into pretty much moving a lot of the data into commercial cloud, but having that accessed from various, um, from various computational cloud-based environments. And as I said, you'll hear more about this on, on Friday afternoon, but the, the model is that, um, you know, uh, and we're testing this out with various groups now, and you'll, again, you'll hear about that on Friday, um, that, you know, I think that the, it, slightly uh, the, the environment is changing. And I think having this more sort of cloud accessible or S3 type storage that's accessible for cloud-based um, environments is probably where we're going, but please come along um, Friday afternoon to that talk. Um, we've got just, uh, oh, I, did Andrew want to comment as well? I see he's just turned his video on. Yeah, thanks, I wouldn't mind. Uh, I, I just think um, really, really useful comments from everybody in that last session. It, it's actually crazy how hard it is to access um, shared compute resources and data infrastructure, even if you know what you want to do in life sciences. And I think that's really one of the drivers for the biocommons. Um, it, it's, it's not a hard thing to do conceptually, but in practice, because of the way things are set up, it's really, really difficult. And that is one of the things the biocommons really wants to address. Okay, thanks, Andrew. Um, I think we just have a minute left. So I think we've run out of time. So. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all the speakers for your time. It's been really great to have your um, input into this session. Um, I, I also wanted to say that, you know, as the head of the community engagement team, you know, we invite everyone to be part of this journey and this conversation. Um, and we, you know, we need to work together to build this more fit for purpose ecosystem of computational infrastructure in Australia. So, um, I'd like to encourage you that if you're not already signed up to a, one of our community groups, and um, so again, these are Tiff mentioned these genome assembly, annotation, metabolomics, microbiome analysis, comparative genomics, proteomics, single cell omics, please join. Um, if you're uh, interested in other, you think there should be some other areas that we should be thinking about focusing on, please get in touch. Uh, our email will be on the next slide. Um, and gen for more general um, updates, you can. We have a we have a biocommons newsletter and you can follow us on Twitter. Our tags are there. Um, so I just want to say I think um, you can email us um, that for the biocommons team, we have a group email communities at biocommons.org.au um, and our speakers are emails there. Thanks everybody.